Hello everyone and welcome to this Kendall Hunt webinar, The Flexible Composition Curriculum in the Age of COVID, presented by Brad Summerhill. Bradley Summerhill is a tenured English professor at Truckee Meadows Community College in Reno, Nevada. He graduated with highest distinction from the University of Virginia and obtained a Master of Fine Arts degree from the University of Arkansas. He was recently accepted into the membership of the International Association of Professional Writers and Editors. He is the author of a novel, Gambler's Quartet, and has a background in journalism. Today, he will be discussing the role of the composition professor, which is becoming increasingly challenging now that classes are more prevalently taking place online and as hybrid courses. Brad will provide practical, applicable ways to take these difficulties and work through them, providing a flexible environment, whether online or in person, which benefits both student and instructor. I encourage you to familiarize yourselves with the Q&A and chat tools at the bottom of your screen. We will be taking questions throughout the webinar. Thank you again for joining us and I'll turn it over to Professor Summerhill. Hi everyone. I'm going to uh, share my video now. And I just ask that, ooh, I just ask that you please don't room rate me. I know that's a thing now. So um, I'm, we're definitely all dealing with uh, first world problems here and, and we just don't need any more. So no room rating, but welcome to this webinar. I'm so happy you're here. It is the flexible correct uh, composition curriculum in the age of COVID. And if you can hear that, does anyone recognize that? That's Morse code or SOS. And I think some of us are feeling that situation right now, or, or at least I am. And I have a lot of experience online, but things feel a little bit different now. Sorry, I'm gonna get that thing down there. Uh, things feel a little bit different now. So let me introduce myself. Megan did a great job. And as you can see from that picture, um, two things. I'm okay with social distancing and uh, I have a dog. And I use that dog in my online class situations, actually in all my class situations. So the dog is my, uh, is the icon for my Canvas learning management system. And I, I find that even just having that little thing, it's like, oh, he can't be a bad guy. He's got a big friendly dog. Oh, and I'll take it, I'll take it. I tell you last spring, um, you know, when we had to sort of move into our homes and video share and just a simple thing like sharing pictures of my dog, like walking around the living room, he'd stick his head in the, in the screen. It really helped. And um, I've been thinking a lot about that lately. I think a lot of us are focusing on relational aspects of teaching and uh, how do you keep that human element alive? I do teach at Truckee Meadows Community College. A little bit about the institution. We're a Hispanic serving institution. And like most two year colleges or junior colleges as they're called elsewhere, we deal with a wide range of learners. So in a given classroom, I have not only uh, socioeconomic and ethnic diversity, but I have diversity in terms of students' uh, learning abilities and skills, really, is what I'm talking about, and, the, and backgrounds. And that, that has to do, that's despite all of the filters that go into getting those students into the appropriate classroom. So what I'm talking about here, though, is not just don't think of it as, OK, well, he's going to talk about community colleges or he's going to talk about composition in a junior college setting. No, I'm talking about composition. Uh, I think about when I went through grad school and, you know, teaching uh, here as a, an adjunct at the University of Nevada. And I think about myself now, I'm a much better teacher now. So uh, I think that two-year teachers have to be a little bit more on the ball in order to reach this wide array of students. And um, I love the university setting, but I just want to make sure that we realize everything I'm talking about here is relevant to 
all college students, uh, at least in my mind, it is so. And, and, uh, and it, sometimes we could extend this down to high school seniors who uh, may be preparing for college. Now, of course, one last thing on this, you know, all the students that I see are not, um, I see university transfer students, they're getting their, they're doing the right thing, getting their first two years in of gen ed. And then I see a lot of um, students who may be career oriented as, as well. Again, I believe the curriculum is for all of these students because I really believe that this curriculum is what our nation needs right now. Um, I focus a lot on civil discourse. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's not a lot of that going on these days. So um, one of the things we need to do in the age of COVID is not only keep it civil, but keep, keep in mind that learning best happens in a calm, relaxed atmosphere. I did blog on about it, and there's the URL that you could find. I called it a sudden transformation. And, you know, everybody says, if you're out there on LinkedIn, everybody's saying, oh, these students, they're going to do so well online because they've grown up. They're digital natives. And my take is a little bit different. I say, these students yearn for human connection. Yeah, they've had digital their whole lives. Even our students in the lower socio uh, e economic um, of, of lower socioeconomic status, you know, are probably digital natives. Um, and of course, that's a huge issue right now with, with internet uh, access. Uh, of course, it's like a utility in the 21st century. You need, you need this utility. But my focus is, is I've, I felt like some of those commentators out there were saying, oh, these kids are going to have such a great time transitioning to and making it through this pandemic because they're all used to everything being digital and online. And I just don't buy that. I really believe that Gen Z yearns for human connection and that we need to keep that in mind. So that was my basic thing is this, this yearning for human connection. And some of my ideas were, you know, just to keep in mind the, the human focus. And part of that is keeping in mind our personal physical comfort level. A lot of people forget that. Um, you can end up with neck problems through Zoom. You can end up with all kinds of physical problems that's gonna make you cranky. At least they, it makes me cranky. So we need to worry about our physical comfort and yet we can feel with the spinning wheel of death there, we can feel like Sisyphus rolling that boulder up the hill. And if you'll forgive me for being a little bit philosophical, I take the Sisyphus image with my students sometimes, and I say, this is you as a writer. And then I, I introduce uh, Camus' essay on Sisyphus and kind of turn it around and say, you know, Sisyphus has a purpose. And his purpose is to roll that boulder up the mountain. And he takes joy in that purpose. So far from this being eternal punishment, this gives his life, his afterlife, meaning. He is doing this. And, and I, th I think it's a very useful thing to keep in mind, at least for me, sometimes when things can get overwhelming. Now, I, I did want to check in with you on our basic assumptions about composition goals. You know, there are national standards that are put out there. I, I think that my department and I think that I personally, you know, align very closely with, with these national standards. To improve cognition is at the top of my list. So I think the purpose of composition is not skills oriented, it is um, cognition oriented. And, and I'm happy to have any of you on the chat, um, please weigh in. And if you think I'm missing something or if you just have a contribution or a question, please don't hesitate. Yes, we are gonna develop writing and research skills, absolutely. We're gonna give students voices and empowerment. And I know that sounds a little bit uh, cliche. 
However, it's just been historically true, and I find that it remains true in the 21st century. If you have these 21st century literacies, you have a voice, and you, you are empowered. I emphasize process over product. Of course, I want to read a good essay. That's part of what I'm going to here to tell you today. I, I'm out for enlightened self-interest, but I'm going to emphasize process over product. Now, oh, who's this? Not with 10,000 men and women. Could we do this? It's folly. And that, that's Boromir, of course, from the Lord of Rings. He just thinks it can't be done. All right, I don't know. But it can feel that way. Like, oh, we're supposed to suddenly make critical thinkers when they've grown up with 280 character Twitter feeds or TikTok, really. I, I understand the kids aren't using Twitter <laughs> for the most part. Um, and uh, I learned long ago not to try to be hip and current. Um, it's for me, it's not authentic. And uh, I'm authentically hip in my old white dude way. And the students appreciate that. They can tell me about their world. I think that's one of my main things is tell me about your world. Uh, I'll tell you about my world. And I'll invite you into this world of, of higher education. And that seems to work well. So typical genre progressions. In composition, we go from the personal to the investigatory. Isn't that so? We start out developmental level with personal narrative. Uh, we might read something, ask for a reader response. Hey, what, what, what's your take on that? And then, then we go into, well, let's substantiate your take. Let's get into analysis. It could be uh, rhetorical analysis. Some, a lot of my students, they, they come into my classes and really the only like essay thing they know how to do is rhetorical analysis and i have to kind of break them out of just a single mode of thinking oh this is what an essay is oh you know i'm supposed to do an introductory paragraph three paragraphs analyzing how the author makes his or her point and then i wrap it up in a conclusion um you know i get my b plus or i get my a minus and i move on with my life uh, no, not, not for me. So a lot of this has to do, a lot, a lot of my experience in the classroom has to do with unschooling students. They, that's a new word for me. One of my, I, I realized I've been doing that, but, but uh, one of my colleagues I appreciate taught me that word. It's un, unschooling. And I realized, well, that's what I've been doing because I'm practical oriented. So I come at it as, as, a, as a writer. Um, good writing is is applicable to to our world so again if there's anything you would add to that list that sort of progression please you know add it um i am working um from my own point of view taking into consideration you know, the work of the National Council of Teachers of English and, you know, associated writing programs and, and all and, and many of these other organizations. So sequences. Now for us, comp one is basically first semester composition. And it boils down to um, uh, uh, you know, this is generalized, but a lot of instructors do personal narrative, rhetorical analysis, leads to comparative analysis, leads to synthesis. I realize some of you in comp one, you may do research papers. And of course, that's fine. I'm just uh, speaking as to what I tend to do. And this is what my department tends to do as well. And then in comp two, we're doing subject analysis, synthetic connections. I'm big on synthetic connections and research. And I find that there's a little more uh, dissonance. I, I don't, I don't wanna necessarily say dissonance, but there's a little more um, wide ranges of interpretation when it comes to comp two. We all agree on that the culmination is the research paper 
and then how to get to that research paper is a is a little more um, wide open. So <clears throat> I'm big on synthetic connections, and a lot of what I'm going to speak to today is deals with um, Comp Two in the latter part of my presentation. But I, I think in general I'm speaking of our full year composition one, composition two uh, sequence. Are there other sequences that you would say, you, you know, maybe at your institution, hey, we start with synthetic connection. We start with jumping into topic investigation. We do full semester deep dives into research and uh, or our entire comp two is about source analysis and then we do a final research paper. Great, wonderful. I think these are pretty typical progressions. So then we deal with word or page count and I'm gonna, I'll try not to get too bogged down because I know this is not new information for uh, you all. So based on best practices, many colleges and universities demand 20 to 25 pages of revised writing per semester times two academic semesters in the year. I prefer word counts to page counts. I don't know if, you know, I don't know if it matters that much. I mean, if you've got appropriate formatting, then you can't, I mean, yeah, rarely I'll get the student who turns in, you know, 14 point type and, you know, a five page paper that has about a uh, hundred words in it. That really doesn't happen very much. And since I went to word count, it, it really, I don't think it happens, happens at all. Um, and I do make my st students put the word count on the paper. They can get access to Microsoft Word free online. And uh, I'm sure you all know that. So as a side note here, what I want to say is, um, does this sequence do these standards because we all have standards my students uh, as educators do we understand the difference between standards and standardization i find that my students have difficulty with that and i find that um a lot of the discourse out there and mainstream regarding higher education and and k through 12 education has a little difficulty with the concept of differentiating between standards are good. Standardization can be problem, problematic. Uh, I say there are many roads to Zion. We, we can get there a lot of different ways, especially in higher ed, thank goodness. I, I don't know how my, my brother does his K-12 thing. He's a, he's a teacher. I just, I just don't know how K-12 teachers do it. And, um, I really admire what they do. But our first year college comp sequence, does it seem appropriate to you? Does anyone want to weigh in on that? Do typical comp demands match the 21st century life experiences of the students? And if not, so what? I mean, academia does not have to meet up with students' expectations or with their life experiences, but we, do we, we all do know that they are, we're experiencing um, con, what I would call compactness or condensation in terms of the literary form. And I'm not just talking about the difficulties of reading materials online. I, and, you know, related cognitive issues of, uh, of shortened attention spans. I've, You've heard the millennial short attention span was eight seconds and now Gen Z is down, the experts say, to five seconds. If they don't, if something doesn't catch their attention in five seconds, they're on to the next thing. I, I don't know how much credence to give to those insights and studies, but they are out there. And I do think there appears to be some validity to the idea that we are all demanding shorter attention spans. I mean, I'll give you an example from my life. If I get a work email 
that is five pages long and I don't know what it's about by the first paragraph, it's gone. And, and, and this isn't the new world so much. This is, you know, I come from the, the world of writing, journalism, creative writing. And if your lead paragraph doesn't catch your editor's attention, doesn't interest your editor, it goes in the slush pile, right? So there's actually something to be said. I wonder in our work modes in, in academia, do we model what, what we actually want from students? Um, I tend to, and, and this may be controversial, and I'm happy to hear about it, um, I tend to favor more practical modes of communication. In other words, like George Orwell, I, I appreciate plain English communication. He, I mean, he writes this essay in 1946, and you know, some instructors just think anything that is pre-internet must be irrelevant. He writes an essay, Politics in the English Language, in 1946, and I think it is just as relevant today as when he wrote it. So what kinds of modes of communication are we teaching our students? I do think it, it is worthy, is it not, to have them find their own voices? And we need to be careful that we're not asking them to imitate our voices. Okay, that has nothing to do with cognition. Higher cognition can take place in any form of language. So we don't need academic speak in order to be, um, in order to be operating in an intelligent mode of communication. And that's what I go for. I'm more like the standard newspaper magazine editor. I want clean copy, I want clear copy, I want you to make your point in a way that a wide general audience can understand that. So I understand not a lot of this so far has to do with the COVID era. Eh, I'm, I'm trying to get there. Um, I don't see anyone jumping in. So that's why I was sort of blathering on there. I thought someone might want to jump in. Should we change our standards for the 21st century? I don't know. I'm okay with the standards outlined so far. I really am. So. Um, we actually do have a comment here. Right? Oh, we do have a comment. Okay. And what is that comment? Uh, so how do you encourage synthetic connections in practice? Key strategies or assignments? That's great. And actually, let's go to the next screen because one thing I, I, I did want to, if, if we can, you know, boom, if I could, if I could surprise you with a pop-up assignment, maybe that this will help because this is a synthetic assignment and it has to do with now. Okay. And what I would do is say in terms of um, the, the general point of today is don't be afraid to surprise your students, give them good surprises. So here's a good, an example of a good surprise. So I have an old essay, it's an old feminist essay, Why I Want a Wife, from 1971. And I've had colleagues say, oh my, 1971, how could it possibly be relevant? And I just, I, I don't see where they're coming from. I have to be honest, because it seems so relevant. And when we got into the pandemic, and I thought about this 1971 essay, and then I saw a Harvard Business Review essay on gender equity begins in the home. And it's like this team of writers, uh, I believe it's a man and a woman, are, are almost saying the same thing that Judy Brady said in 1971. Lots of things have changed since 1971. The world <laughs> is completely different now and in 1971, and we need our students to understand that, right? However, some of these issues remain relevant. So what I would say is with a pop-up assignment, you can do a, uh, you can encourage a synthetic connection. Take what's ever in your core curriculum and connect it to something that's out there in the here and now. Maybe it's Black Lives Matter. 
maybe it is um, COVID-19. Maybe it is the experience of life in isolation. Maybe it has to do with uh, how social media simultaneously fulfills and does not fulfill our human needs, especially in this, in this current moment. So you, you all know those, those things are out there. So take your core curriculum, find something that's out there, and just give them a pop-up assignment. Say, hey, you, you know what, guys? You can do the assignment that we planned. However, I've been thinking a lot about this lately. And that, I think that gets the students involved. It gets them, they might think, yeah, you know, I've been thinking about that, that lately too. So just like my favorite restaurant here in Reno had to go pop up in order to survive in the COVID-19 era. Take, take out wasn't working for this place. They are going under and then he adapted. And uh, um, Tim said, you know what? I'm gonna do pop-up meals, set price, set menu. I'll sell tables to people who are comfortable, obviously being together. And that's a survival strategy. So I would say pop up and then you can do the synthesis uh, right there. Another synthesis assignment that's real easy to answer that question is, okay, I want you to find three um, valid, well, however you want to define that, three valid YouTube videos on the same topic. Although I, might, I must say, it, it might be fun if you allow them to throw in varying levels of validity. Uh, and so, but you could say find three YouTube videos or find three social media sources on the same topic and analyze those three sources and analyze how the particular medium affects the message of each of those sources. So they're doing a lot of things there. They're, they're um, analyzing source, sources for validity. They're, they're scrutinizing, hopefully, the authority of the source. And they're thinking about how the information comes across. So there's another idea for you. This is my, oh, I just touched my face. Ah, OK. I think we're a little less paranoid about that than we were six months ago, but still. I'm doing the uh, muzzle swipe, you know, that these days. The default rigid curriculum is definitely my own. This is my default. Fixed deadlines, fixed assignments and topics, fixed word and page counts. It's comfortable for me, right? So I'm saying, yeah, come into my world where I'm very comfortable. And you know, of course we give our students an invitation and we can make it comfortable for them. But we also need to think that the concept of rigidity may be uncomfortable to students who are already uncomfortable. Okay. So we have some flexible curriculum alternatives. Um, I think we need to keep in mind the holistic goals, right? So the holistic goals have to do with cognition. It has to do with enhanced learning. It has to do with success in life and in academia. So we might think of rolling deadlines or deadline ranges. I mean, have you guys ever told students during week, you know, six of the semester, SA2 will be due? And, you know, I don't care if you give it to me on Monday or you give it to me on Friday. You know, rolling deadlines, we can all have different definitions of what that means, but you, you can have open deadlines. Like, in other words, I need you to achieve three things this semester. You're going to achieve um, thing one by the end of month two. You're going to achieve uh, thing two by the end of month three, and you will achieve our culminating goal by the end of uh, we don't have five months in a semester, but you, you get the idea. You can have three, just three goal-oriented deadlines, or you can just have simple flexibility. Like, for example, I tell my students, if I give you a Friday deadline, because I use Canvas Learning Management System, and I just use the default, and the default is like 11.59 p.m., 
and I just use that default. However, I let my students know if I, if I give you a Friday assignment and it's due on a Friday, you're free to use the weekend. So, so Sunday midnight, but I, I don't give Sunday midnight because th then the students roll that into Monday and, and uh, you've all experienced those things. So we can think about being flexible with our deadlines. The important thing is that they get the work done. No, I don't let them all give it, give it to me all at the end of the semester. No, that's a bunch of BS. You're not allowed to do that in the real world or in academia, and you're not going to do it to me. And one of the things I, I'm with this flexibility that I want to make clear is I'm not telling you to do more work. I am not. I'm saying allow the students to do more work, allow the students to make more decisions, put a little bit more of the onus on them. And, you know, it's not burden. You can call it ownership. Give them some ownership. So we might give them choices on assignments and topics, and we might give them actually uh, options on assignments or uh, on word counts. So I'll give some examples so I can be clear. And I've actually been, even prior to COVID, I started experimenting with this stuff and I found, I found some, some success. So here's an example that in unit three, you will complete two 600 word synthetic uh, connection essays or one 1200 word synthetic connection essay. Deadline for completion, Deadlines for completion are April 5th and April 15th. You must select your topics and present the uh, topics, blah, blah. You can read what I wrote. The concept here is they have to commit to a, for a classroom forum. They have to put it in writing. They have to commit to what they're going to do. But if a student is super intimidated by a 1,200-word essay, why not let them write two 600 word essays? And actually they need to read twice as much material. And I know some of you are thinking, oh, then I have to grade twice as much. A couple of things. I always find shorter essays are easier to deal with, okay? And the students may not be as intimidated. They may do a better job. And if they have some ownership in what they're doing, they're more likely to do quality work. So, there is, I'm gonna be talking a lot about choices. There is a choice paradox though. And I've, I've, I, I know just enough psychology to be dangerous, okay? So um, use your own common sense and judgment here. But based on the work of positive psychologists like Daniel Gilbert, still trying to get that, okay, a little better. Based on the work of uh, positive psychologists like Daniel Gilbert and others, we realize that choices do not make humans feel better. Choices make humans think that they will feel better in the future. So in other words, if you ask someone, would you rather have a choice or would you rather have me choose it for you? Almost all humans will say, I'd rather have a choice. And what the, the studies show is that that's not true. There are actually we human animals are more content when the choices are made for us that sounds disturbing doesn't it it's disturbing to me but there's another thing choices can be acceptable when they're irreversible so a reversible choice creates unhappiness so in other words if, if you've, they've done daniel gilbert and others have done studies when you Let's say you have a, a class of people and we're going to create a work of art, like a photo. And then um, at the end of the class, you get to, you only get to pick one photo. But if you want to change your mind and then pick another photo five days later, you can do that. And then the other group is, you know, at the end of the semester, you get to pick one photo and that's it. You can't change your mind. And what the results show is that the people who had reversible choices are less satisfied with their choice. Whereas the people who have irreversible choices are content. And that's what we want, content students. We want content, comfortable students. So what I would say is, hey, maybe sometimes it's this or that, this or that, this 
I like that. But don't give them a big laundry list to choose from. You're going to intimidate them. You're going to scare them. And when they make a choice, make them commit. Make them commit to that choice. Okay? That's ownership. Commit to a choice. Commit to doing this. And then um, it, the studies show that the, the student will uh, be more content, will be happier. A simple, flexible approach provides advantages to student and instructor in the classroom and in life. And if you don't mind, uh, I will uh, wax a little bit is what it is, okay. philosophical. If you can- I said empty your mind. Empty your mind? Who, who's talking? Be formless. Like water. Like water. So you put water into a cup. It becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. The water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. So you may or may not have been able to hear that, but that's the famous quote from Bruce Lee, uh, definitely one of my heroes. And uh, he's saying there, you know, water is formless. It's the, it's the most, uh, it's the strongest of all elements. If uh, you put it in a teacup, it takes the shape of a teacup. If you put it in a water bottle, it takes the form of the bottle. Uh, water can crash, but water can also be soft. Be water, my friend. I, I think we can all use that advice in this semester. Be water. Let's be soft. Soft is not weak. Soft is strong, and soft makes everybody feel good. You know, it makes the students strong. If you're strong, your students are going to feel strong as well. So I've been thinking a lot about this era we're living in. And this, these are just, you have these thoughts too. These are just the thoughts of a teacher, which is how can I do my job better? I happen to believe, as I'm sure you do, that my job is important and uh, it makes a difference in the world. And I, I feel like if, if, if we could put students out there who have their own voices and can can critically and independently think about their world we are going to be better off and i don't know about you but i think that's what we need right now so what i want to say is don't be afraid to experiment don't be afraid to be be water get away from the rigidity and let's just Let's hold students to high standards. This is not about lowering standards, but let's make sure that as many students as possible feel as comfortable as possible in this weird time that we are living in. And it, it is weird, right? So when I think about my classes, and this is, this is a little more specific to comp two, that is English 102 second semester composition, um, I, I divide it up into levels. So if I think about essay tasks and levels, then I can take the same theme or subject matter. And as some of you have, have determined, I don't teach genre writing, okay? And there's nothing wrong with genre writing. But I find that in, if our goal is cognitive development, that genre writing is more oriented towards building skills and, and, and fitting a form. And certainly that's important. You know, there's like, for example, there's nothing wrong with the five paragraph essay. If you af af communicate effectively in a po five paragraph essay, there's nothing wrong with that. That's good. However, if a student believes that every form of writing has to fit into the five paragraph essay mold, that is bad and that is stunting the student's cognition and it is stunting the student's um, actual skills as well. So I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, hey, we're going to write this type of essay. Mm, excuse me. Sorry, itchy. I don't think there's anything wrong with, with saying, we're gonna write this type of essay at this time. That's fine. Um, I come at it a little bit differently. I come at it through 
thematic or subject orientation. And then I think of dividing all the skills into levels. So everything my students need to do in English 102, second semester composition, can be put into level one, two, or three. Level one, I call it analysis response because the text comes before your view of the text. And your view of the text, we don't necessarily need to think of that as opinion. You, you, you know, the response part of it is, is I think, comes in with, with what you as a teacher uh, bring to the classroom. The response part of it can be very personal. The response part of it could be even further analytical, like this is what's important to me. This technique, I found this technique effective. Um, it could even be why, why I care about this subject or why I don't care about this subject. But it's analysis response. It's really close reading and responding. Two is the synthetic connections. When you have read three or four texts on the same subject matter or similar subject matters or maybe widely different subject matters, you're gonna start being able to make connections and you're making those synthetic connections. And, and, and um, you'll see how I do that uh, uh, down the line a little more clearly, I hope. But I think it's such a wonderful goal that it, allow, it demands, it demands critical, creative thinking on the part of the students. And, uh, you know, some of my colleagues are going to say, well, they're not there yet they're not capable. Well, how would you know if you don't trust them to try? And so what if they do a higher order um, cognitive skill and they fail at it? That's okay. That's okay. What is, for me, what is not okay is giving them such simple tasks that they are bored, they can't pot, they don't risk any kind of failure. And I don't mean you know, when I say, oh, they failed in the assignment, I don't mean a grade. I just mean, yeah, they didn't do it very well. Isn't that part of learning? Isn't that part of growth? Not doing things well? I don't know about you guys, but that's how I learned how to teach was by not doing things very well. Maybe I shouldn't admit that in a uh, professional development webinar, but you know, I think if we're all honest with ourselves, I don't, I don't learn from a textbook that tells me to teach pedagogy this way or that way. So let's give students ownership. Maybe you give them a checkbox. In order to fulfill my English 102 Comp 2 requirements, I commit to the production of one 1,000 word level one, two 750 level two essays, and one 2,500 word research paper. The student gets to choose that and commit that. Maybe the student wants to say in order, this could be, imagine this at the end of your syllabus or imagine this as like the third page in your welcome module in your learning management system. I, 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 all this stuff isn't about online. I use the Canvas learning management system whether I'm in the classroom or online. But look at this, you know, I commit to this. And this is not to say we're just producing these essays and we're not doing any scaffolding. Of course we're doing scaffolding. Of course we're doing exercises, responses, discussions. Of course we're doing all that. But I'm just saying, we, look, we know what the big goals are. How about we give the students a little bit of ownership and allow them to take part in it? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe it's this. You know, I actually found, you, you're going to find this hard to believe, this is the one that most of my students committed to. More essays. Wow, right? Or you might ask them to take a deep dive on a theme. Maybe your theme this semester, would it be great if your theme was racial justice this semester and you could find appropriate or 20th century texts, fine, you know, come on, civil rights era stuff. Um, and then also 21st century, century here and now stuff. Um, 
that's actually, I'm doing a little bit of that in a film analysis class uh, this, this semester. In pursuit of substantive knowledge, anyway, I'll let you read that, but you could allow the student, maybe we have a, a, a theme for the semester and you're gonna allow the student to take a deep dive into that theme. They can't repeat work, but they can revise work. And uh, maybe you're comfortable with that, maybe you're not. You know, alternate assignments, uh, I mentioned something similar earlier. Uh, consider the critical urgency of now. So they could go out there and say, hey, you know, guys, let's examine this. Um, let's examine uh, the issue of, of wearing masks or herd immunity. Let, let's go a little bit deeper. Let's, let's examine the issue of herd immunity and the concept of that. Um, well, I want you to find a YouTube video, a tweet, and a podcast that all deal with how herd immunity is achieved. And then, uh, you know, give me a write up, describe what role this, the format plays and all that. Consider suitable internet options and assignment substitutes. This is flexibility, right? Allow or force students to take control. Adaptability and innovation are key. If they are not up to the task, you can have a fallback core curriculum. Okay, you all have a core curriculum right now. I'm just saying, don't be afraid to do pop-ups. Good surprises, good surprises for your students. Don't stress, don't do the work for them, please. And for the love of all that is holy, do not make it extra credit. Now I put a smiley face there, but I am dead serious when I say that. If you make it extra credit, that is a signal to the student that it doesn't matter. So don't make it extra credit. You could maybe make it a substitute or a choice, but it has to be an irreversible choice. So we worry about these things, right? Oh, there's the bird. What is that? What is, what is that? Oh my gosh. So far from Bruce Lee, this is what we fear. Yeah, I'm gonna try some, you know, Kung Fu moves and I'm gonna end up like this guy. What if it doesn't work? What if I can't control my, my, the variables? The human animal is the biggest variable, right? Isn't flipping the classroom just an abdication of my responsibility? Well, I'm here to tell you, and this is my, this is my uh, inspirational moment. You're awesome. Trust yourself. That's my message to you. And I hope that that's your message to your students. Because just the idea of trusting students empowers them to do work that you might be surprised how much better it turns out when you just simply say, yeah, you know, make a choice and go with it. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Do it. Now, we all know <laughs> they're not all good. They need help. They need skills development. But that can be our internal dialogue. I, I call my teaching persona Mr. Bradley. He's the guy who my dog thinks I am. I put that in, that in that blog post. So students will float to the mark you set. It was actually true in 1989 and it remains true today. So this isn't about lowering standards, it's just about being flexible. I hope that I gave you some ideas how to be flexible in your own curriculum. And what we have come to is engaging discourse 2.0. I'm very excited about this textbook. It's out in the spring. And um, even though uh, as a person, I, I have a, um, and I see a strong connection between uh, writing and civic engagement, but I have definitely made great efforts to remain, uh, I mean, all, some people are gonna say all writing is political. Yeah, actually I agree with that. But these topics are not political. Okay, so they're science oriented topics. So um, 21st century literacy, what literacies do we need? Our, more importantly, what literacies do our students need in this world? Brain plasticity, social disconnection, appropriation, the biology of romance, AI and robotics, generation studies. Okay, boomer, I'm not boomer, I'm Gen X. And happiness studies. And what is neat about this textbook, in my mind, is that there are clear, and granted, they're clear to us, 
but we but the textbook helps make the synthetic connections between each of these chapters clear to the students so there are clear connections between brain plasticity and social disconnection. And I know some of you are saying, I don't know anything about neuroplasticity. I'm not a scientist. Well, guess what? Neither am I. However, this is what I'm saying. As teachers, don't we need to get out of that mode of thinking that it's not about us? It's not about how authoritative we are in, behind our Zoom camera. Let's quit pretending to be authorities on everything and allow the students in an appropriate way. See, we're their guide. We are their guide through this world and, we, you know, through the world of composition. But, you know, there are larger translations to, to, to life itself. I've tried to make some of those clear here. Okay, so that's what I'm saying is just because I wrote my thesis on, you know, um, the social mores of 18th century England doesn't mean my students want to study that topic and it's a worthy topic. But what I'm saying is let's get out of this old fashioned mode that you need to be the authority. You need to be the expert. No, you don't. You need your students to teach you. I want my students to teach me. I'm a very interested person. I'm interested in a lot of these things. So, you know what? Oh my gosh. Boromir was not right. Boromir, oops, sorry about that. Boromir was not right. Um, Frodo was able to achieve his uh, goal. He got rid of the ring. You know, he dropped his burden. He was very comfortable doing so. And he experienced this moment of joy, right? And I think, oh, yeah inspiration baby inspiration i believe that uh our students can experience a, a kind of joy by taking ownership of their curriculum maybe we unschool them a little bit and uh, they write well enough trust them you know there we go there we go are you feeling it Alle Menschen werden Brüdern, you know, all people will be brothers. And students who don't care, feel put upon or see no point, those are the students who struggle. Have you noticed that? I mean, one of my pet theories is that, as the music plays, one of my pet theories is that grammar problems seem to magically disappear when students care about what they're writing. Have you noticed that? And I, you know, of course it's not really 100% true, but there's a truth to it. They, the students simply write a lot better when they actually care about what they're writing, when they take ownership of their topic. So I just want your students, my students to take that ownership because it makes life on us easier, right? It's all about enlightened self-interest, right? <laughs> okay, I hope I'm not a narcissist, like someone I know in the public sphere. But, um, you know, I've got a, uh, as a writer, I have a, and an artist, I've got a good amount of, of ego. So I'm definitely out to make my experience as a teacher more meaningful and better. And the way I do that is getting better essays. That makes, that makes my life. Uh, easier. Now, in terms of grading strategies and things like that, we all have those. I've got those. I didn't really go there in this seminar. I, I didn't want to abuse your time and bore you that much. But the bottom line is, it's not about us. It's about our students. We don't need to take on more burden right now. Uh, we just need to share that burden with our students. And they are ready to step up. Trust me. And you may say, boy, in Reno, Nevada, they put out smart students. <laughs> there are smart students here. Um, but, you know, last time I checked, Nevada was like 49th uh, in the nation. So the thing is, if I can ask my students on, on an education list, and, and I love my home state. That's why I'm here. I moved here for to live here, um, not necessarily uh, 
for the job. I was just lucky to get the job. But what I wanna say is it's about the students. It's about their interests. It's about their cognitive development. So if we set out to teach students to think what we already think, how is that helping them develop cognition, creativity, or any of the things we really want them to develop? So, you know, trust your students. And you know what? A lot of times, 18, 20 year olds, they're gonna be sorely mistaken and flat out wrong about, about some of the things they say and think and do. And that's okay. That's okay, you know? Um, so anyway, I really appreciate your time. I'm sorry if I ran a little bit over. I hope I didn't bore you. That is the greatest sin of all, is um, boring uh, my colleagues or my students. And I welcome any questions or contributions, uh, please. Well, thanks very much, Brad. Uh, one question that we have is, if I offer my students a current events topic for an analytical paper, what are the best ways to ensure they will select valid source materials for the paper? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, what I would do in that case is um, maybe do a preparatory assignment uh, such as an annotated bibliography assignment. So you have the students do a bibliography in which they may be given the explicit intent of evaluating the authority of each source, evaluating the authority and the validity of each source. So in, you know, you don't have to, I do one annotated bibliography for my 102 per semester, but you could do like one of the things I'm big on process is telling my students to do the work cited page first. So you establish your sources first. So all you really have to do is say, turn in your work cited page um, 10 days ahead of time or a week ahead of time or whatever it is. And then um, present it to me and tell me why you think these are good sources. And then it, get, it could kind of give you a chance to weigh in and say, you know, I, I think that Kardashian tweet um, on this, that, or the other. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm picking on Kim Kardashian. She actually got people out of jail. So bless her. You know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't do that. But does that make any sense? Um, so you could just uh, look at the process a little bit. You can also, as a class, of course, collect, do a screen share or in front of the class and have a student in the class say, hey, share a link here. Okay, let's go, then let's link to that. So, okay, let's look at this as a class and then do a peer evaluation. What I, again, we don't need to be the authorities. What you find in studies uh, show this. I'm not a big, um, I like the results of studies. I, I, <laughs> I like executive summaries of studies. That's my sin as a composition teacher. My, um, but the studies show that peer evaluations very closely mirror what instructor value evaluations are on the same task or the same assignment. So you can open it up to the class and say, okay, let's evaluate this as a class. Okay, there's, there's some ideas. Excellent. And another one that we have is, do you use evaluation rubrics while grading papers? Yeah, that is a, that's a, another great question. Um, I do, they're a little bit, they're a little bit, um, they match my philosophy because I find if I'm going to use a, a department rubric or just a, a standard rubric taken from somewhere else, that doesn't closely mirror what necessarily I want the student to achieve. So what I generally do is, let's, let's take a 100 point assignment. I generally break down five categories of 20%. And the top category is my holistic evaluation of the assignment. So I honor the, uh, the concept that there, you know, writing is about more than checking off boxes. Did you do this? Did, are all the periods in the right place? And so that very first top is my holistic evaluation. And I write up a little thing. And basically I take the stance of not so much teacher to student as 
editor to writer. So in other words, your, your editor is going to have a professional opinion of what you're doing on a holistic level. And, you, you, you know, that way you, you need not take it so, so personally. So, uh, and, then, and then the other thing I would generally have, you know, ability to quote from the text and to properly integrate um, the whole way down to formatting. So, you know, and generally speaking, there's five categories of 20% uh, uh, each. And, um, you know, I'll do things like if a student fails a given category, I give them half 50% credit in that category. So just, you know, failing one category isn't the end of the world. Or if they get a C in one category, that's, you know, um, you know, they, they lose five points um, in that in that category. So anyway, yeah, I hope that helps. Excellent. Thank you. Well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. So that concludes today's webinar presentation. Uh, we're very happy you could join us today. In the coming days, you'll receive a link to this recorded webinar. And if you're interested in Brad's publication coming out for spring or his current publication that he's got out now, uh, contact Deb Roth at D-R-O-T-H at KendallHunt.com and she'll be able to talk about course adoption with you. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody. Bye.